I wasn't going to do this, but I think I'm going to do it anyway. Um, one day, God looked down and saw Adam. And he was walking in the garden, and he was going like this. And God looked down and said, Adam, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm lonely. I, I, you know, the birds, I don't have any, anyone, anything to talk to, to share with. And I'm just darn right lonely. And God said, well, what would you like for a mate, Adam? He thought a minute and he said, well, I'd like her to have a good figure. I'd like her to be a good cook and a good housekeeper, of course, and especially a good mother. And, um, oh, yeah, one more thing. Could she never get headaches on Friday night? <laughs> and God looked at him and he said, well, that's a pretty expensive order you got there. And uh, he said, how much is it going to cost? And God said, an arm and a leg. <laughs> and Adam looked down, and then he looked up, and he says, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> today, today I'm going to share my story with you from the very beginning. Um, it's a sad story, but it's a good story. I'm not proud of it. It was my secret for many years. So I have a question for you. I'm about to share my biggest, deepest, hardest, ugliest secret with you. What's your secret? Everybody's got one. It may not be mine. It may be a small thing. It may be a big thing. I wish I would have not said this. I wish I wish I could have seen that person one more time. I, I wish I had gone there. I wish I hadn't said what I did, or I wish I had said more. All those things we always hold as if, you know, I wish I could go back and change this. Now, my question to you is, have you let it go? Some of them are big, and some of them are little. I have these two rocks here. They're both rocks, they're different sizes, they're different colors, but they're still rocks. In God's words it says he can't abide sin, but sin can be a big one or a little one, and either one can trip us up. What's your sin? What's your secret? Have you gotten rid of really that whispering inside you today? Because as you will hear as I get into my story, I thought I was healed at one time, even when God showed his hand to me. And yet I couldn't find myself able to forgive myself. So as I share my story, I just ask you, think about yourself. Make sure the enemy doesn't have a hold on you. I was 39 years old and had two teenage daughters. I had been in the flower business for many years, just in, a, in Portland, Oregon, and I was able to purchase a flower shop just outside of the limits of Portland, Oregon, and it had been number seven out of seven. And it was my goal to improve it. I've never been pretty. I've never been speci especially pretty. I've never been really top-notch on anything, but this gave me a goal that I could do, and I found myself doing very prestigious things, like we were asked to decorate the state capitol for Christmas one year. Uh, we got to help with, uh, what's the guy's name that I want to talk about? The boss, the guy that's the singer that's the boss back in America. He, we got to, he, his, he, his first wedding was about 15 miles from my shop, and uh, we were asked to help do his wedding. So we would go to bridal sh shows, and they'd ask my two girls to model, and they would use my flowers, and I felt like I'd really arrived, and I was feeling good about myself. I'd never really felt I was anything special before, but I wasn't feeling well. 
Finally, the girls in the in the shop said, "Kay, you need to go to the doctor. You've got the flu or something. You're you're pale. You're heaving every once in a while, and just go get checked out." Sure, I'll go checked out. Finally, so I went into a doctor's office. The doctor sat me down, and after I changed into my gown, he put me on a metal table. And uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm jumping it. I had to do uh, what they called a counseling session. Well, you know how I just forgot about the counseling session? Well, so did they. Because when they came in and sat down, when the lady came in and sat down, and I'm sitting there in this room waiting for her, she said, well, Kay, I understand you want a, a, an abortion. I said, yeah, I'm thinking about it. She didn't say a word. She forgot about the counseling, just like I did. She turned the page around and pushed it at me and handed me a pen and said, sign right there. That was it. I signed it, and I signed my, my daughter's death certificate just as much as that. Come back tomorrow, and we'll take care of the problem. Well, you know what? When the man came in the door, when the doctor had taken his exam of me and he'd gone out, he did come back. And when he said, GK, you're pregnant, congratulations. At 39 with my shop, I'd been shocked. I had already adopted one child because I couldn't have any more. And here he was telling me I was pregnant at 39 and my shop going. And I said, what am I going to do with a baby? Well, the lady with the white dress over there in the corner and she might have thought she was a nurse, but I'll never call her one, said a few words that changed my life. You know, we gotta be careful how we handle things like that when we casually throw a suggestion to somebody. And all she said to me was, lucky for you, you don't have to have this thing anymore. It's not a baby, it's just a, just a, piece, of, just a piece of tissue. That's all she said. She forgot to tell me about the nights that I would cry. She forgot to tell me that it still becomes a baby. I wished I'd have asked her, what magical moment does a baby become a baby? Scientists now say on conception. But back then, she could get away with saying anything because the sciences, sciences hadn't said anything yet. So the second day, as I said, I went back, crawled on the table. They give you enough anesthetic that you will not remember, but you can cooperate with pushing just like you would natural birth. I waited a few minutes and the man that came in, and he's not a doctor. Doctors don't kill people. Doctors help, they don't kill. And he began the procedure and told me to push turn a little bit on my side, whatever I need, whatever he needed, I did. And a few minutes later, the tissue was released from my body. He had it in his hands, and he came around the side of my bed, right up to the head of my bed, and I looked at it. The tissue had arms, legs, a face, hair. I had been five months pregnant. Then he put his foot on an aluminum tin, a tin trash can. The lid came up and he tossed her in and the lid slammed shut and he walked away. And I heard that trash can hit and I knew what I had done. He just left. Get your clothes on and you can leave in about a half an hour. Well, when I saw it, I started screaming. I mean, what had I done? What had I done? But they came back in and said, you've got to be quiet. You're scaring the other patients out there. Well, I wished I'd have kept screaming, but I didn't. I was silent, and I went home. It was weeks that I would wake up every night hearing the thud of that body hit a garbage can. And I would wake up in the middle of the night after that thud that I would hear screaming. 
And after that, I would get to the foot of my bed on my knees and I said, God, I didn't know it was a baby and I'm sorry. Please, if there's anything you can do, if you can give me another baby, I promise I'll be good. I, I'll be the best mommy in the whole world, I promise. But please, please forgive me. If you give me a child, I'll know you forgave me. Well, I used to go to church all the time. But church people can be so picky. Isn't it funny? I went all my life and thought they were my friends. Overnight, suddenly they're, they're too picky. And if they found out what I did, what would they do to me? What would they say? Would they tell the whole name? I couldn't go to church anymore. Besides that, God doesn't want a murderer in his house. So I skipped church. I found some friends that I could run with and my husband could run with that were a little more accepting, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, if they found out, they wouldn't judge me. Well, that went on for many years. And I kept screaming in the night. It was about a year and a half after that that I found out God had answered my prayer. I had a beautiful little boy and I was pregnant again. And I was so thrilled. And he was so beautiful. And I said, God's forgiven me. And everything's going to be all right. But it wasn't all right. You see, God forgave me the minute I screamed out the first time in, in, my, in my dreams, in my living room, in my kitchen, how many times I screamed. It only took once. He forgave me. But like I told you, look out. Because even with the signal of the baby boy that I had prayed for that would give me the sign that God had forgiven me, I had not forgiven myself. And you become a nobody. You became a nothing. You don't care about your hair. You don't care about your clothes. Actually, I ignored my girls as they grew up. How can you love two teenage girls when you just killed one? And I paid for it. And I saw her. She wasn't tissue. That was no tissue. Finally, I decided I would get a job. So I got a job at U.S. Bank. And I was working, and it actually was good that I could get out and get away because church was kind of out of the way anymore. And our friends, other than that, there wasn't much social life, and there wasn't much happiness in our home either. So I started to work, and I was doing very well. It was probably six, eight, nine months. I don't know for sure anymore now. When all of a sudden, one day... I bust out crying, and I couldn't stop. I locked up my, my computer, I locked up my desk, and I walked to my boss and I said, Jenny, I gotta go home, I gotta go home, and the tears were just rolling. And she looked up at me as if to say, what's wrong? And then she said, yeah, you need to go home, Kay. You, you call me in a couple days when you're okay. I said, okay, and I ran out the door. I got in the car and started driving, as I was headed home, I drove past my real doctor's office and I thought, I'm a mess, I'm ruined. I don't know if you can put me, but somebody's got to do something. So I pulled in, walked in the office, and the minute I walked in the office, the receptionist looked at me and said, Kay, come with me right now. And she took me to a back room on the Davenport waited for a few minutes, and here came my doctor. And I mean a doctor. He sat down beside me, put his arm around me, and he said, Kay, what on earth's wrong? I cried and sobbed for a few minutes, and afterwards I gagged out the words. I hadn't spoken in years, but I gagged it out and I said, I had an abortion. And I can't stand myself, and I don't want to live, and I don't know what to do. And he patted me, and he said, Kay, it's okay. We're going to get you some help. I'm going to get you three psychologists and psychiatrists to look and talk and work with you. You're in bad shape. I said, yeah, I am. 
And he said, I'm going to get those three, but you have to take some antidepressants. Because I said, I don't want to take antidepressant drugs. They're, he said, you got to take them right now. And if you don't take them, I won't get you help. So I agreed. Well, I went to the psychiatrist with the big frame on their wall that says they've been to all these colleges and they have all this knowledge. And I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't getting anywhere. And my husband was frustrated and the girls couldn't understand. I had never told them. I found out later that they found out, but they couldn't understand what was going on with me. Well, I, to this day, don't know how this man found me. But he was a little pastor of a little church down the road from my apartment where we lived. And he said, you've had some problems. Can I help you? And I said, I need help, but I, the help I've got is not doing me any good. And he said, let me try. Come to my office. I found out he had fourth stage cancer. And yet he helped a stranger because he knew I needed help. Well, I went there for several weeks. And during those weeks, he kept telling me, you know, you're forgiven. I said, yes, I, I, I know I'm forgiven. Big sin, little sin. But do you realize what I did? I killed a child. He said, can you not find any place in the Bible that says this big sin can't be forgiven, but this little one can? No, it's not there. But there are repercussions when you have big sin. When you throw a rock in the water, the ripples are like this. When you throw a little rock in, the ripples are like this. And that's the way with our sin. We recognize big sin because it causes big ripples in our life. But the little ones we tend to overlook. And that's why I ask you to think again about those things that you think you might not have let go of and you think you have. Well, he kept telling me about how much God loved me. He kept telling me at how great things were and that everything was going to be okay. And I kept saying, you don't understand. You don't understand. Listen to me one more time. I went in and paid to have my daughter killed. I saw her body. She was not a piece of tissue. And at the time, I'm falling apart as I'm telling you. And he said, I'm okay. It's okay. You were forgiven when you ask for forgiveness but you haven't learned to forgive yourself. I said, he couldn't forgive me. He just couldn't forgive me. There's no way he could forgive me. A couple days, we'd probably gone on like this for two weeks. Now he was dying of cancer and he told his, his, his wife, I found out later, that he said, I wanna spend the last few days with my family. But Kay's eternity depends on if I can get through to her or not. So I'll be spending time with her. I walked in one day, and he was sitting behind his desk there in his office. His arms were folded, and he was rocking in his chair. I said, morning. Kay, I owe you an apology. I said, what? He said, I owe you an apology. Why do you owe me an apology? He said, you're so special. God sent his son down here to be spit on, laughed at, to be mocked, to walk those hills in Jerusalem in dust and sandals and sleep out in the desert, and then to be, to be found guilty of something he didn't do to be beaten until he was like a piece of hamburger and then dragged up to the cross, hung on that cross. All he had to do was say, I can't handle this, Father, get me down. They're not worth it. But he didn't. He stayed there. 
and he, they stuck a sword in his side. And they laughed at him and they put, threw lots for his clothes. But he stayed. And he died. And then they buried him in a tomb. And he rose again. But that's not good enough for Kay Painter. Oh my gosh. I hadn't looked at it that way. He said, no, God's going to have to send somebody extra down or have Jesus come back and perform a miracle or two because everybody else in the world can find freedom from their sins through Jesus Christ, but not you. And I apologize because I didn't know you were so special. I sat in that chair and sobbed for I don't know how long. And I said, what do I do? He said, you don't have to do anything. He's already done it. You need to forgive yourself. That's a hard thing to do. When you've committed something like I did, and sometimes even little things, like you may be tripped on right now, have you let go? Have you really let go so that you're free? The enemy loves to have a little bit of say in how worthless you are or how incapable you are or how no good you are. You're a child of a king. You're the son and daughter of the creator of this world and this universe. And what the heck made me think that I was something? I didn't, and I didn't see it from that prospect, but I could understand. I went home and I told my husband as soon as I could get through bawling, I'm free. He figured it out. He knew the answers all along. I just wouldn't listen. I'm free. We sat down and talked a little bit, and the March for Life was coming up in Washington, D.C. And I said, I'd like to go. I feel I need to go. He said, Kay, we don't have the money, but we'll put it on a credit card. You go. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any organizations. I found one that I plugged in with when I got there called Operation Outcry. Women who speak out against abortion who've had one. But I didn't know a soul. I got in there and it was like a dorm place that they put us in and I picked a bed over in the corner so nobody would bother me. And I was just surrounded by these girls and they said, you're here for the first time? And I said, yeah. They said, oh, it's, it's wonderful. We've all been forgiven and we're going to go be in the march together and we're so glad to have you and congratulations, you're free. And I couldn't believe it. During the programs, I learned so much about freedom and so much that I could do and so many things that could be used to be good, to help, to try to stop abortion. I was overwhelmed. They had a table on the outside there with their their pamphlets and their information on it. And this one particular Saturday afternoon, they all wanted to go out and look at the, the sites in Washington, D.C., which are everywhere, of course. And I said, you know, I'm just not up to it. I didn't feel like I was, I, I just felt like I should stay. So they said, will you run the table? I said, sure, I don't know anything about it, but I, I'll do it. He said, well, you know enough about abortion and that's what they're gonna be asking you about. And I said, okay, so I stayed. I stood there a while and a few people came by and I greeted them and talked to them. And then funny, this, this, this late little lady came up. She was about 35, maybe 40, blonde hair. And she had the cutest little accent you ever did hear. She said, uh, have you ever thought about talking about it to somebody? I said, what do you mean? She said, what about sharing it? I said, I don't know. I, I've never thought about that. And she said, well, we could use somebody like that to talk. Um, we've never heard anybody in Australia that's ever talked about their abortion openly. And you'd be the first. Would you come to Australia? Boy, would I like to go to Australia. I said, sure, but I don't have any money. I don't. She said, that's okay. That's okay. 
God will work it out. Here's my card, and you be in touch with me when it turns about. I was flying high. I'd been invited to Australia. I'd probably never make it, but I'd been invited, and I was, wow, from being a nothing and a nobody to I'm going to Australia. It's a pretty big step. That night, my roommate and I were praying on our knees alongside our beds. Oh, got to go back. When she left, she said, uh, uh, it's going to take some stamina to get to Australia, but you can do it. I said, OK. So we're on our knees praying and asking God to show us what he wants us to do and where he wants to go. She was from Florida. I was from Idaho. But we prayed, and we were praying, and all of a sudden, she said, Kay, God just gave me a word for you. I said, a word for me? God's never spoken directly to me that I know of. She said, yeah. He said, go build stamina, both physically and spiritually, for I have a journey for you. Stamina, stamina. Could it be God had plans for Australia? The next morning we got on the plane, she left, and I got on my plane and started home. Well, as I walked down Ronald Reagan Airport, I wanted a sign that said, I regret my abortion. I didn't know of any that were in Idaho, and I wanted one, and I couldn't fit it in my suitcase. So I'm carrying it, my suitcase in one hand and the sign in the other, and you should have seen the looks I got. <laughs> Woohoo! I got to the gate where we were going to uh, board. And here's these two cute little nuns running around with about 15, 10 to 12 to 13 age kids. And they are just all over the place. And the little nun looked at me and she said, you're one of those? I said, well, <laughs> I think I'm gonna be, but I haven't yet. She said, if I could quiet them down, would you talk to them about abortion? I said, Okay, I'll do it. Yeah, so she sat them down, and one nun stood there and went over there to make sure they'd keep their hands to themselves and listen. So I was talking, and pretty soon I had a crowd here, and I had a crowd there, and I had all these people listening in like this, and I thought, oh my gosh. They called for the plane, and I thought, Whew. <laughs> So we got on the plane, and guess who's sitting by my side in the airplane? The little nun. And we were, got up in the air and we were talking and I said, that's a wonderful idea to start them at 11 and 12. By the time they're 15 and 16, they know it and they're not going to listen to anybody anymore. But I said, that's great. She said, yeah. She said, we do it every year. And I said, uh, oh, where, where do you go? Do you come here every year? She said, no, no. She said, uh, we went to England last year and this year we came here. But next year, we're going to have to build stamina. <coughs> because we're going to Australia. I started crying and she said, oh, sweetie, I didn't mean, what did I say? I said, I think I'm going to Australia too. And I don't know. And she put her arm around me and prayed with me and told me how proud she was. And we, she got off in Nebraska and I came home to Idaho. I told my husband what happened and he said, honey, whatever, whatever you need, whatever God wants, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. That night, I laid down on the floor. I woke up in the middle of the night, and something was different in the room. I can't explain it. I got down on my face, flat on the floor, and I started crying. And I said, God, I can't believe you'd forgive me. I can't believe you give me a new start. I can't believe that I'm, I'm free of all what I did. And if you want me to go somewhere and do something, you just tell me and I'll go wherever you want. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I can never pay you back for what I just went through and what I've discovered in myself. And I was sobbing and it, it was great. <laughs> uh, a couple days later, we had rented a rental home up in a, a recreational area up out of our town. 
and uh, I was looking for a house. Instead of giving Christmas presents this year, my husband and I decided we would rent a big house. We'd invite our kids. We'd have our grandkids. We'd fix the food. We'd pay for the food. We would pay for the house, and the boys could go golfing, and we girls could go shopping, and the kids could play on the beach, and it would be our Christmas present. It was a lot better than having them take a sweater back because it was the wrong size. So we did. But in, in the conversation, she said, uh, uh, what do you do? I said, do you do this all the time? She said, yeah. I said, oh. She said, uh, have you thought about uh, anything else? I said, no, no, this, no. I said, uh, can I take my dogs? Changing the subject. And she said, no, we don't let dogs come in. They uh, have a tendency to pee and to scratch and to shed hair. And then we've got too much of a mess to clean up the rentals afterwards. I said, I've got two Yorkies and they don't shed and they don't pee. And uh, we'd like to rent one of your houses. She said, okay. I said, well, they're really good when I take them out with me when I drive around and go to different places on, on business. And she said, what kind of business? And I said, well, I'm changing businesses. And she said, well, what are you going to do? I, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my abortion story with people. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Are you there? I'm here. You talk about it. Well, I'm starting to. What did I just do? We need to meet. Could we meet, please? I said, sure. I'll meet you at a little restaurant close to you, and we'll meet on Thursday. So I went with a couple books that are workbooks to work to help people who've had abortions see scripture that encourages them that they are forgiven, that the baby is okay, and to get them right back where I had found myself. I didn't want them left back there where I was. And we had lunch, and we talked a little bit. Um, she, I told her about Washington, D.C. I told her how excited I was. I told her about the wasted years that I'd spent hating myself and everybody else. So she said, well, I said, I'll, I'll come to your house. I'll bring, I'll bring the workbooks, and you work on them, and you do one through three pages, and I'll be there Thursday afternoon, and we'll walk, work through them together. And she said, well, what if my daughter comes in? I don't want her to know I've had an abortion. And I said, just tell her it's a Bible study. Don't worry about it. She'll run on and want to play anyway. She said, okay. So I went there, and um, she went home, and I stayed to pay the bill. I turned around after paying the bill to leave, and she was right there. I thought she'd left. I said, what are you doing? She said, how much does it cost to go to Australia? I said, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I'm going. She said, oh, you're going. <laughs> She said, I started to get in my car, and God told me as clearly as I, you can hear me, pay her way. She said, how, how much money do you, I said, I don't know. She said, do you know, I don't know. Said, well, I'll have your check for you by Saturday. Is that okay? I said, you must be kidding me. You've got to talk to your husband. I mean, I could go out and buy me a new TV, and you'd never see me again. <laughs> He said, well, that would be between you and God. I'm not getting into that. Yes. But um, she said, yeah, I'll have it for you by Saturday. I went home and told my husband, and he and I both cried. God had made a way where there was no way. Australia was my first trip. Since then, he's opened doors that I cannot open. If he calls you to something, if he asks you to do something, he will provide and take care of you. It's really quiet in here. I have made 39 international trips. South America, the Philippines, Japan, Spain, Ecuador, 
Chile, Romania, Ukraine, Serbia. Uh, I, I can't, I, I don't even have a whole list of them. He paid for every one, and I never asked for a cent. You see, when God asks you to do something and you're in his will, he'll take care of it. You don't have to. You don't have to. I came over here, and it was like a second home to me. And it was so much fun. I got my check, and I called the girl, lady, and she said, Oh, really? I said, Yeah. She said, okay, I'll get ready. Give me a couple weeks to get it lined up and come ahead. And we started from, uh, it, actually it was the lady over here that helped me was Teresa Martin. And she helped me from the way down there to the way up there on the side of the east coast of Australia. And I spent three weeks chopping at every little store, every little store that had a couple ladies in it that were sitting there having tea in the afternoon or we had evening places at church. And I began to speak. I couldn't believe it. I was in Australia and it was paid for. Have you thought seriously about what God has called you to do? He doesn't call everybody to walk around the world. He doesn't call everybody to get in a plane and fly and go to different countries. But we were born with a purpose. And that purpose is through him, somehow, some way. It may be your next door neighbor. It may be a member of your family. But you have a purpose too. You know, somebody said to me once, you know, it's really great. You get up there and have all those trips and you do all that. And you, you, you know, that's, that's a pretty upfront thing. And you're pretty lucky to get, I, I am, I am. But let me remind you, we are a body. We're not here as individuals. God made us to be a body of Christ, united in all things. You see, a body has to have a, every part working and to be used properly in order for the body to function. Poor little big toe. He not so pretty. I don't know about yours, but mine isn't. So how often do you thank the big toe for being there? How often does somebody stop and say, gee, you've got a pretty big toe? <laughs> Not often. But do you know a doctor will tell you that if you don't have your big toe, you can't walk straight? Now the little toe down there does his job unthanked and unnoticed. But without him, the rest of the body doesn't function. Now it sounds like a pretty picture for me. I've been spit on. I've had murder threats. I've had telephone threats. I just happened to be the one he put the big mouth on. He gave you big toes. So we all have a part in this. We've got to stop the murder of babies somehow, some way. I, I can honestly tell you I never dreamt I'd live this kind of a life, that I would be traveling like this. I can honestly tell you that Australia is my second home. When I told Lori that I was coming back, she said, Mom, if we hadn't, when I moved to Idaho, my kids were elsewhere. But it, one by one, in about four years, they all came to Idaho. She said, if we weren't living here, you'd have gone to Idaho to live, wouldn't you? I said, yep, I would have. So I want you to stop and think when you look at those little shoes. They're all pretty and shiny. Never been used. Because of my selfishness. Because I couldn't face that it was a baby. I could accept it was tissue. I wasted years. Some of the things I thought about myself and trying to commit suicide at one time. I prepared myself for death. I looked around and I thought, that was at the very bottom. I said, Lord, I am no use to anybody. I put my little boy that had been my answer that I asked for, and I put him in my car and I drove him to my oldest daughter's house. And I said, could you watch him for a couple hours? I got to do some shopping. And she said, sure. 
he was real excited to go stay with his sister and she it, she was in a cul-de-sac and I turned around and started to drive away and my little boy stood there and he says bye mommy bye mommy I'll see you real soon bye mommy bye and I looked back in tears and I thought no honey I'm not coming back the world's not for me I'm I'm so messed up. Instead, I went home and straightened up the house. I didn't leave a love note or anything. They wouldn't care anyway. The world would be better off without me. So I went down to the highway. I was always known as a fast driver. If I hit this big brick concrete wall for the overpass, it would be an accident. They'd have all that life insurance. They'd have me out of the way. I wouldn't be a problem to anybody ever again. I drove to that highway and looked at that wall, I don't know how many times. And I would step my foot on it as soon as the, car, the cars were clear. I would step on it and head for that wall and then I would swerve. And I don't know how many times I did it before I gave up and went home. But you know what I told myself? You're, so, you're such a loser. You can't even kill yourself and do it right. See, these little shoes should have been filled. These little shoes should have had a little girl named Sarah giggling in them, but they didn't. Now I'm free. Now I'm talking. There are repercussions for everything we do. Big ones, little ones. Rock, this one's white, this one's not. This one's big, this one's little. This one's funny shaped, it's different, but it's all the same. It's made of the same composure. So is sin. Sin is made of the same composure, no matter how big or how little. It's called disobedience to God's word, which is what I did. I thank him every day for where I am today, for the happiness I have, for the joy I have. There's no explanation for it except through Jesus Christ and accepting the fact that he died for me. So I ask you today to search your own heart. If there's even a little bit of a doubt, get it taken care of. And I'm going home in two days. God bless you.